Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is another colloquium organized by the Severo Ochoa program in the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia in Granada, Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Richard Parker, and he will talk about the influence of the star forming environment on planetary system. Uh, Dr. Isabel Marquez will introduce uh, Richard. Isabel. Hello, good morning. Thank you, René. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for, for coming to our coming to our, our seminar today, our web locum by uh, by Richard Parker. And uh, and thank you, Richard, for, for accepting our invitation to, to give this online seminar. Um, I extend the invitation to a to a in, in person visit to our institute. We'll be proud to have you here if uh, when, when possible. So uh, Richard Parker is a research fellow and lecturer at the University of uh, Sheffield in the United Kingdom. Uh, born in Newcastle, uh, Northeast England and attended uh, Sheffield University as an, as an undergraduate. He then spent one year uh, from 2005-2006 working at the um, ING telescopes in La Palma in the Canary Islands in Spain, you all know. And in, tw in 2007, he went back to as a PhD student at the University of uh, Sheffield, uh, where he defended his PhD thesis entitled Dynamical Interactions in Star Clusters in 2010. He then got a postdoctoral position at the um, ETH in, in Zurich in Switzerland, and then returned to the United Kingdom in 2014 to Liverpool John Moores University where he held uh, your Royal Astronomical Society Fellowship. In 2016, he obtained the Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Research uh, Fellowship that he has uh, uh, um, also now. His research interests cover star formation, planet formation, stellar and planetary dynamics, and using statistical methods to quantify astrophysical phenomena, mainly spatial and kinematic structure in star forming regions, so connecting planet, planetary systems with uh, with stars. Richard is also involved in widening participation in STEM subjects for pupils from underrepresented uh, backgrounds in Sheffield and the surrounding uh, areas. He sits in several committees within the University of Sheffield concerned with addressing the gender imbalance and lack of ethnic diversity among students studying STEM subjects at Sheffield. So th this is very well in line with what we are celebrating today since we are the 11th of February the International Day uh, for uh, Girls and Women in, in Science. So it's especially relevant for, for us. Um, today, he will talk about uh, the influence of the star forming environment on planetary systems. Thank you very much, Richard, and uh, I, I give you the floor. Okay, thank you, Isabel. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but um, I think this is the next best thing. and. Um, I would very much love to come and visit you all in, in Granada, which I've seen as well as one of my favorite cities in the entire, in, in the, in the entire world. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, sort of trying to piece together most of my stra different strands of research um, to address the kind of one of, one of the questions I, I find fascinating from uh, many different perspectives, and that is what the potential influence of star forming regions and star forming environment is on the formation um, and the, the development of planetary systems. And um, this, this has been worked done in collaboration with lots and lots of uh, different people. Um, but I just in particular, I want to highlight um, two current PhD students, Christina Shuttler and Emma Daffin Powell um, in Sheffield, and um, also um, a couple of um, undergraduate students that have um, helped me with some of this work as well, uh, Bethany Wooten and uh, Haley Alcock. Um, and so all of this work is really kind of built on the foundations of um, these, uh, these uh, incredibly talented students. Um, so one of the sort of fundamental questions that um, I'm, I'm sure lots of people in your institute are interested in as well is um, we kind of don't really know where most stars are born. And what I mean by that is um, we don't know what the kind of typical conditions of the environment are that, that in which most stars like the sun are born. Um, so when we, when we look kind of in the, in the nearby galaxy and also a bit further away, we see completely different, um, different, different flavors of star formation. So we see these kind of very um, low density 
um, diffuse um, things often called stellar associations. And these regions often only have densities of only a factor of 10 or so higher than uh, the sun's current density um, in which it sits in the, in the Milky Way today. Um, but on the other hand, um, we see things that are a lot more dense, so up to you know, 1,000 or 10,000 times as dense as the sun's current environment. Um, for example, the Orion Nebula cluster is the, um, the, the, the image shown on the bottom right of this slide, and that is the closest stopping region to the sun that contains massive stars. Um, if you go to more extreme environments, go to the large Magellanic clouds, and the 30 Dorada stopping region um, contains, we think, upwards of 10,000 stars and um, contains the most massive stars we know about in the universe, which are thought to be hundreds of times more massive than the sun. So there's a huge kind of range of, of, of kind of um, environments in which stars and we think by extension planetary systems um, can form in. But one of the things that we don't really know is what the um, initial um, density is for star formation. Um, so there, there's a school of thought that all stars form in very compact um, clustered um, regions and that they all have very, very high densities. But actually, if you look at the um, density distribution of young stars in the solar neighborhood, um, there's, there's quite a range. So this, this um, diagram here is showing the cumulative distribution of um, the densities of young stellar objects in the nearest 400 parsecs to the sun. And you can see that there's, there's, there's a smooth continuum in this graph, okay? So we're going from very, very low densities all the way up to very high densities. Oops, so I'm just going for a slide. Um, and so people have different ideas about what constitutes a kind of dense or, or clustered environment. Um, and the, the vertical lines just show that, you know, people essentially choosing values almost at random for what they think, you know, defines a star cluster or a, 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 you know, a collection, a dense collection of stars. Um, all I would say here is that I'm, I'm very much sitting on the fence on this. Um, I don't really think that you necessarily have to define clusters based on a, a density threshold. And the different densities are important for different things. So when you're at very high densities, so you know, 200 stars per cubic parsec or so, those densities can directly affect planets that are forming around stars. So you can change the orbits of planetary systems. And I'll talk about that later on. Um, but also, if, if you go to lower densities, then they're not really any less important. Um, if you have very massive stars, they um, emit um, high amounts of um, ionizing radiation, and that radiation can disrupt or change the um, disks from which planetary systems form. So there's a huge range of, of stuff going on given for a given set of stellar densities. And one of the things that I'm going to try and unpick in this talk is you know, which density regime is important for, for, for different um, processes. So there's a, a, a problem with trying to work out what the typical density is for star forming regions. And that is um, something that I've called the, the density degeneracy problem. And so what you're seeing on this graph is the evolution of um, density um, in uh, n-body simulations of star forming regions. So these, these n-body simulations are, 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 are set forward in time. And the only physics really that is included is Newton's second law, so the force due to gravity of all the stars on each other. Um, but what you see is when you start in a very dense star from a region, so um, around about 1,000 stars per cubic parsec, then the star from regions are very, uh, very much out of equilibrium, and they try and relax, and they do that by expanding. And so you can start off with very, very high stellar densities, and then rapidly over time, these densities decrease to much, much lower values. Now, if we plot the values for nearby star forming regions on this diagram, you can see that they're very much consistent, just at phase value, with these star forming regions starting with much higher densities. So the, the red symbols here are corresponding to the proposed initial density of these star forming regions. So the square, the red square up here, is the proposed initial density for the Orion Nebula cluster, and this is the Orion Nebula cluster today. So it's still fairly dense at its current age, but the idea is that it was much more dense when it was born. And the reason that I call this the density degeneracy problem is that if you start off with lower densities initially, then you can get the same 
current or same present day densities. So if I flip between these slides, you can see that we're starting with uh, much, much lower initial densities, but the observations today are consistent with both scenarios, okay? So you start with very high densities, and these evolve to much lower densities very, very quickly. Or if you start off with lower densities, the star from regions don't need to dynamically relax as much. And so the evolution is less, um, less violent, less chaotic, and you can reproduce the star densities that we observe today. So on the face of it, this seems like um, a kind of a, a catch-22 situation where we can't really work out what the initial density is. However, we can place constraints on the initial density by factoring in other measurements. Um, in particular, if we measure the um, spatial and, and, and kinematic, the velocity information of these star regions, we can get a much better handle on the initial conditions. So what I'm showing here is one of the n-body simulations that, um, that we use extensively in this research. So we start off a, with a, this is supposed to be a star region, but all, all we're modeling here is gravity. So we don't convert the gas into stars or anything like that. And the star from region, once it starts evolving, rapidly erases its spatial and kinematic substructure. And the red points are the most massive stars. They're initially spread out randomly in the star from region. And after a certain amount of time, they sink to the center of the star from region. And this is a process called dynamical mass segregation. And let's see if I can run that again. So what you see here is initially we're not moving as forward in time. This is just revolving around the star from region, looking at it from different angles. And once the simulation starts, you are raising a lot of the substructure very, very rapidly. Okay, so if we can quantify the evolution of this structure, then this will give us a good idea of, um, of what process or what, what phase in the evolution an observed star from the region is. Okay. And as I said before, the most massive stars tend to bunch up in the cluster center. So this is a, a further um, diagnostic that we can use to describe the evolution of these regions. So there's there's various ways of quantifying structure, um, and one of the one of the ones that we tend to use is um, this so-called Q parameter. Um, so lots of people have worked on this, including Emilio and the group. Um, and the Q parameter essentially um, draws a, a minimum spanning tree between all the points in the distribution. So minimum spanning tree joins all the points um, by a, a, a graph, and there are no closed loops in that, in that particular graph. And so if you choose the, um, the mean length of the minimum spanning tree, so on the right-hand side of this um, slide, you can see all these different branches. Um, if you choose the mean length of those branches, then you have a value M bar, and then if you draw the complete graph, so you join every single point in the distribution to every other point with a line, that's the complete graph, and that has a mean length S bar. And so the Q parameter is just simply the ratio of M bar to S bar. Now, if you look at something that has a large amount of spatial structure, then that has a very low Q parameter. So this particular example has a Q parameter of 0.4. But if you look at something that is kind of smooth, that looks like the end point of the animation that I just showed, then that has a, a much larger Q parameter, um, tends to be above one. And so what we can do is we can quantify how much structure a star from region has based on this relatively simple measure. And so we can then go back to our, um, our, our plot of the evolution of the density. So these, this is the very, very dense star from regions that are evolving very, very quickly. And they're starting off with a large amount of spatial substructure. So the Q parameter down here is very, very low, but you can see that it rapidly attains very, very smooth morphologies in a very short space of time. So we're wiping out the primordial structure very, very quickly. But interestingly, what you can see, if I plot the same observational data that sometimes it's consistent with the uh, present day densities. The Q parameter, so the measure of structure for these observed star from regions is very different from the simulations. So the simulations with very, very dense initial conditions are in the main inconsistent with the, um, with the observations. So that's putting some sort of constraints on the initial density of the star from region. And if I go to the lower initial densities, so here, we're still producing the present day densities of these star regions. 
but you can see that the Q parameter, the observed Q parameters are lying on top of simulated values. And so I always have trouble seeing this the correct way around. The correct way around to say it is that the simulations are consistent with the observations for these low density um, initial conditions. Um, so here we're kind of placing constraints on the initial density of some nearby starter regions by saying, okay, the initial density is probably no more than around 100 to 1,000 solar masses per cubic parsec. But that's still a very dense environment. Um, and we can add further information as well. So one of the things that we've been working on the last couple of years, and really this has been driven by um, Christina Schottner, who's a PhD student who's been working with me. Um, Christina has been looking at um, stars that are, are, are either runaways from their star region, so they've been ejected at high velocity, or um, the stars that have been ejected at much lower velocities, which are called walkaway stars. And the number of walkaway stars that you get from the star region is a strong function of the initial density. So the higher the density of star region, the more dynamic interactions you have, and the more stars are ejected at significant velocities. So on the left-hand side of this slide, you're seeing stars of different masses ejected um, over time in the simulation. Um, and uh, the high density scenario, you get lots of ejected stars. Uh, for the lower density scenario, you get much fewer ejected stars. And so what, we, what we're doing with this work is we're, can, we're, we're using the Gaia telescope to say, okay, I'll look around the periphery of a star from region and we'll simply count how many runaway and walkway stars we see and determine what the likely initial conditions of that star from region were. So this is that in practice. So what we're seeing here is um, color magnitude diagrams um, for the Orion Nebula cluster. And um, we're looking in particular for runaway stars. So these are defined as having velocities higher than 30 kilometers a second. And then we're looking for walkaway stars that have velocities between five and 30 kilometers a second. And basically the, the red points with the error bars on the left-hand side, the left-hand plot, are um, runaway candidates in two dimensions from the UNC. So you can see that we see a few of them. But if you look at the right-hand plot, you can see that there are way more stars that are ejected at much smaller velocities, um, so-called walkaway um, velocities. Now, before Gaia, we might have been able to pick a handful of runaway stars around the outskirts of the UNC. And people have been doing that for several decades, actually. But we were, it was very, very difficult to pick out walkaway stars from um, Gaia, sorry, from, from kind of, you know, proper motion archival data and that kind of thing. It's really Gaia that's kind of completely revolutionized this area. And it's allowing us to place strong constraints on the initial conditions of these star regions. And this is kind of tying together where Christina has added some radio velocity information and determined which stars are probably runaway and walkway candidates in three dimensions around the UNC. So what we're doing is basically trying to build up kind of more and more information on top of each other to try and constrain the initial conditions of star from regions. So why does this matter for planet formation? Well, I mentioned a few slides back, we think that planets basically form at the same time as stars. If you look um, around um, young stars, they all seem to have an excess in their spectral energy distribution. They have an excess of flux at infrared wavelengths, and this is attributed to the presence of a disk around the stars. And the fraction of stars that have this infrared excess, this disk fraction over time, um, decreases quite significantly. So it's suggesting that most young stars that are only a, a one or two million years old have these disks that could potentially form planets, and then older stars don't have the disks, either because they've already formed planets or because the disks have been destroyed or, or they've dissipated. Of course, now with ALMA, we can actually directly image a lot of these disks around young stars, and there's been an incredibly large amount of work done on this, um, and we're getting really good kind of population censuses of um, disks around young stars. And then this plot is basically the same thing. It's just um, you know, adding more data. Um, and again, this is just looking at um, infrared excess in star regions. But you can see that there's a significant, um, significant uh, fraction of, of young stars that have disks and then that drops over time. So what's responsible for this depletion in disks? So I mentioned before, it, it could be planet formation, um, but it could also be um, destruction from outside effect. So I mentioned that some star from regions are, are dense enough that um, their disks can be 
directly truncated due to interactions with passing stars, but at lower densities, um, in lower density star forming regions, disks can be destroyed by the radiation from very massive stars. So this is a very famous image of the Orion Nebula cluster, and the boxes in this image are zoom-ins of young stars that appear to have um, disks shown in silhouette in the strong radiation coming from the massive stars. And these disks appear to have um, this sort of little kind of like tails or, or ionization fronts where they can consistent with being disrupted by radiation from the massive stars. So this appears to show disks being destroyed kind of and, and being caught in the act of being destroyed. Now, this is predicted from simulations. Um, so if you um, calculate how likely it is to evaporate um, gas particles from a disk, you actually find that this is a very, very, um, very rapid and very efficient process. So this is some simulations from Howarth et al, um, where he's modeling um, the disruption of a protoplanetary disk under the influence of radiation fields of, of different strengths. So um, up here, we've got um, 10 G naught. So G naught is the strength of far ultraviolet radiation in the interstellar medium. So this is 10 times the strength of the radiation field in the interstellar medium. And down here, um, if I get my pointer back, you have uh, 10,000 times the strength of the radiation field in the interstellar medium. And so you can see that for the, 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 the disks where the uh, radiation field that is bathing them is um, 10 times that in, in, the, in, in the interstellar medium, you're still destroying the gas from the disks very, very rapidly, so within 10 million years. But if the radiation field is much higher, uh, and this is shown by the, the black dashed line here, then you're destroying the, the, the gas from the disk within a couple of million years. And the solid lines are just showing what happens to the dust. So the dust generally isn't affected by photo evaporation. It's just the gas. But interestingly, the typical radiation fields in star forming regions where there are massive stars are much, much higher than the interstellar medium. And you can have values that are 1,000, 10,000 times the radiation field in the interstellar medium. And so, what we've done is we've modeled um, in our n body simulations, uh, we haven't actually included the disks in the simulation themselves. We've done something called a, a post processing analysis where we've taken the data from the simulations and then after the fact, we've assigned disks to these stars and we've looked at given the amount of radiation that star receives over time, what would happen to its protoplanetary disk. And because the stars are moving around the cluster, you have different radiation fluxes at different times. But what we find is that this radiation is, is very, very destructive. Again, this is for the gas component of the disks, not, not for the dust, but, but for the gas. And what you see on the left-hand side is a reasonably dense star forming region. Um, it's got a density of about 1,000 solar mass per cubic parsec. And the disks, um, is what we're showing in this plot is the fraction of disks remaining over time. And that fraction of disks decreases quite, quite rapidly. Um, and these disks are initially 10 AU in radius. So they're very small disks. And if we decrease the density, so if you go towards the right-hand side of, of the slide, we're decreasing the density by a factor of 10 in the star region each time. And you can see that the fraction of disks that survive steadily in increases. The gray points are the um, observed disk fractions that we see in star regions. Um, I, it's a bit cheeky to kind of compare the two because those those observed disks are predominantly dust, right? They're not gas, but it's just kind of to try and kind of give you some idea of, of how quickly these processes are thought to happen. Now, this has constraints for the birth environment of our own sun. Okay, so in our solar system, we've got two gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, that could only have formed if there was a significant amount of gas left in the protoplanetary disk when they were forming. So if the um, protoplanetary disk that formed um, the sun was more than a, about 10 AU, then what you see, and this is shown on the, the right-hand side of the slide, um, you see the disk fraction is very, 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 very rapidly decreases over time in these star regions. So there's virtually no disks left after about 4 million years. So if you're wanting to form gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn at you know, 10, 20 AU, 
you're really going to have to do that quickly if there are massive stars in the star formation that are emitting this radiation. On the other hand, you can just about get away with forming Jupiter and Saturn if they are forming much, much closer to the star, so within 10 AU um, in, in the protoplanetary disk. And so almost immediately, we're beginning to place constraints on the birth environment of our solar system. Now, another thing that we've been looking at in particular concerning the, the, the evolution of protoplanetary disks is um, an apparent correlation that exists between the mass of a protoplanetary disk and how far it is away from a massive star. So what this plot is showing is um, on the, on the um, x-axis is the distance from the most massive star in the Orion Nebula cluster, Peter one or C, and the, the y-axis is showing the mass of the disks. And so what you see is apparent correlation where the further you are from the massive star, the more massive the disk is. And the interpretation of this up until now has been that this is because if you're further away from the massive star, then the mass of the disk is going to be bigger because you're not suffering as much radiation flux. Now, I don't agree with this interpretation at all, um, I, it, but it, 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 it's, it, it's been observed in other star regions as well, this, this correlation. So this is Sigma Orionis. Um, this is a, a lower density environment than the Orion Nebula cluster, but you see the same thing. So the further you are away from the most massive star, the more likely it is you're going to have a massive disk. Um, and this is, this is shown on the right hand side of this plot. The reason I don't agree with the interpretation that this is due to um, the radiation from massive stars is um, a combination of two things, projection effects and dynamic evolution, which we've seen happens a lot in these, in these star forming regions. So, for example, if I have a star cluster and I've got a massive star in the center that is emitting this radiation and I say okay well the discs within a certain radius of that star are going to be depleted by that radiation field they're going to be evaporated by the radiation then if I look at that in um, three dimensions if I have all the information then I would expect that the the stars in the central regions would the, the discs would lose their their mass um, very very quickly so this is, this is showing, um, this diagram here is showing disk mass against distance from the star. Now, again, this is just for some fake data that I've created, um, but the expectation would be that you would reduce the mass of the stars that are closest to the, um, the massive star. Redu sorry, reduce the mass of the disks that are closest to the massive star. However, it, you're looking at the star from region in two dimensions most of the time, and so, the disks that are affected by radiation, shown by the red points here, um, are going to be confused with disks that are either in front of the center of the region or behind the center of the region. And you can't disentangle them because it's a 2D, two-dimensional projection. And so almost immediately, you can see that any correlation between the mass of the disk and how far it is from the massive star is going to be blurred somewhat by these projection effects. The second point as well is that we modeled this in simulations and we can't find any evidence of a dependence on the, the, the mass of the disk um, as a function of distance from the massive star. So what we're shown here is um, in each of these panels, the blue points are um, data for Sigma Orionis, the orange points are data for the Orion Nebula cluster, and the pink points are data for NGC 2024, so another star from region in the massive star. And we're showing the mass of the disk versus the distance from the most massive star in those regions. And the black points are data from our n-body simulations where each star has been assigned a disk. And then depending on how much radiation it experiences, that disk may be destroyed or it may lose some of its mass over time. And so what we see is we see very little dependence on the mass of the disk as a function of how far away it is. And Furthermore, if we look at the fraction of stars or the distribution of stars that have disks versus those that don't, we see that actually those two distributions lie on top of each other. So to begin with, before we invoke any sort of um, photo evaporation, um, the disks that are surviving have this distribution um, shown by the open histogram. 
And then the disks that are destroyed, so these are stars that don't have disk anymore, they have this distribution in space. So this is the distance from the most massive star. They have this distribution. And you can see that over time, we reduce the number of stars that have disks. So the black histogram is decreasing and the red histogram is increasing. But those two distributions lie on top of each other. So there's no, there's no dependence on how far away you are from the massive star in terms of whether you have a disk or not, or whether your, your, how massive your disk is. And this actually makes sense if you think about it, right? I showed some animations earlier on of the star from region evolving very rapidly in time. And the stars mix with each other. They mix around, they move around the cluster. You don't expect the stars to kind of sit almost like sunbathing on the beach, waiting for this radiation to come at them and then kind of happily sit there. That's not how gravity works. The stars move around. So what is responsible for this correlation of uh, disk mass with increasing disk from increasing distance from the massive star in these star regions? Um, I don't know, but I don't think it can be explained just from the flux coming from the most massive stars. If we compare the, the simulation data to observations of stars that have disks versus those that don't in the Orion Nebula cluster, and this is shown um, by this um, histogram on the uh, left-hand side of the slide, then you basically see the same thing you see in the simulations. So the, the, there are stars that have disks, there are stars that don't, and those two distributions essentially lie on top of each other. And so you know, what's causing this correlation, um, we're still at a loss to explain. So I've talked about destroying disks. So say that you somehow survive the, um, the, 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 the radiation fields from massive stars, um, or say you form a star for region where there aren't massive stars that are giving off this radiation, um, you can still affect the orbits of planetary systems in star from regions. So this is a plot um, showing, it's a few years old now, um, I should really update this, but it's a plot showing the eccentricity of extrasolar planets shown in black versus their semi-major axis um, from their host star. And the solar system planets are shown in comparison in red. So the first thing you notice is that lots of exoplanets have very high eccentricities, um, but also there are lots of exoplanets that are very, very close to their host star compared to um, the planets in our solar system. And furthermore, a lot of the planets that are close to the host star are Jupiter mass or even higher. And so conventional planet formation theory tells us they can't form there. So something or some things must have moved them closer inwards. Now, there can be many processes that can do this. So you can migrate, planets can migrate very efficiently in disks. Um, planets can interact with other planets in their own planetary system. But also planets can be affected by interactions with passing stars in star from regions. So what I'm showing here is um, simulations where we started off planets with um, perfectly circular orbits. So zero eccentricity. And they were all at 30 AU. So they're all at the position that Neptune is in our solar system today. And if you, uh, we, we assigned a single planet to each star in an n-body simulation and we let, let it evolve in time. And after 10 million years, you scramble the orbits of about 20 to 30% of all the planets, okay? So increasing the eccentricities between zero and one. Um, some of the planets are moved closer into the host star and some of them are scattered further out. Um, about 10% of the planets become free floating. Okay, and so they, uh, most of them just wander around in the cluster. Some of them are rejected, um, but a small fraction of them are then captured around a different star. So you have this scenario where planets, you know, jump between different host stars in the in the dynamic evolution of the star from region, and these are shown by the by the red points in this diagram here. And a lot of these captured planets have very very high inclinations, and they have orbits that look very, very different from the orbits of planets in our own solar system. So this is probably doesn't explain the um, wide variety of orbits that we get for all extrasolar planets, but I think it certainly could be a contributing factor, especially given that um, recent observational work has found that planets are essentially forming almost immediately after star formation. So within half a million years, in some instances, people are seeing a significant signal of a planet embedded within a disk um, around its host star. So in a star from region, you can have 
um, interactions with passing stars, but also um, the effect might actually be worse than is predicted just from assuming that all stars are single when they're born. Um, most stars are formed not as singles, but in multiple systems. So either as binaries or um, higher order systems, such as triples and quadruples. And um, this plot here is showing um, the fraction of the, multi the multiplicity fractions, the fraction of stars in multiple systems as a function of their age. And you can see that for main sequence stars, it's, it's, a, it's, it's relatively lower. But for young stars in stocking regions, it's quite high. And so we have an added complication. Um, furthermore, we can't really quantify how bad this problem might be because the data on binary systems in stocking regions are incredibly limited compared to what we have in the galactic field. So on the left-hand side, are showing the distribution of um, binary orbits in the galactic field um, just within, within, within the sun's local environment. And then on the right-hand side, we're showing the um, equivalent plot for um, the Orion Nebula cluster. Now, it's not that the data are missing, it's just that we haven't observed binaries at very close separations. So on, the, um, on this region of the, the right-hand side, the right-hand panel, um, we simply haven't measured the orbits of binaries using spectroscopy in the Orion Nebula cluster. Um, and we have no idea what the binary properties are for these close systems. Um, we think they're probably there, but we just haven't observed them yet. However, I'm sure you all know that planets are not precluded from forming binaries. So Kepler in particular has found lots of um, circum uh, binary planets, so pl planets orbiting a, a, a pair of stars. And also um, people have found um, where, where they've looked for companions to close planets, they've often found a stellar companion at quite some distance from um, the, the, the star that the planet is orbiting. Um, this is a kind of nice arts impression that we had um, commissioned for um, a press release we did with a, a paper a couple of years ago. I'll talk about the paper in a minute. Um, but this is just kind of give you the kind of classic sort of two suns in the sky, science fiction, you know, it used to be science fiction, but you know, we're getting to the point where we're, we're finding lots of planets that maybe do have two suns um, in, in, the, in, the, in the sky. So what, what, what can be the added um, problem with having binary stars? Well, th th there's a few things. So um, there's, a, there's a thing called the, um, well, it's not really, the, it's not just the Kozai mechanism, it's the von zeipel lidov Kozai mechanism. So, so independently discovered by uh, three groups of researchers. Um, but basically, if you have a, a system where you've got two massive objects and then a low mass object, if you change the, orientation or the inclination angle of um, the, the massive objects, then you can have a transfer of angular momentum onto the less massive object. So this would be applicable to um, planets forming in binary systems. Um, if you have a transfer of angular momentum onto the, onto the planet from this, um, this change in the system, then this is what would happen if we put our solar system, the gas giants, the ice giants in our solar system, in a binary system that was subject to the Kozai mechanism. So the first thing you see happen is that you excite the orbit of the outer planet, um, in this case, it's Neptune, and then that in turn excites the orbit of the next planet. And, and Neptune Uranus actually swap positions due to the, the large eccentricities that they obtain. And eventually, the system becomes so chaotic, you end up ejecting the two outer planets, Uranus and Neptune, and significantly increasing the, um, the orbital um, variation of Jupiter and Saturn. So could this potentially um, explain some of the orbits of exoplanets? Well, we think it could. Um, so on the left-hand side is some work by uh, Wu and Murray, um, where they're showing the change in orbit of a, a Jupiter mass planet that's been subjected to the Kozai mechanism. So what you see is um, significant variations in the eccentricity of the planet. Um, and that basically has the effect of um, it, it damps the orbit of the planet and moves the orbit of the planet closer to its host star. So this planet started off at around about 5 AU, and then it finishes off, the semi major axis of the planet finishes at around about 0.2 AU from the host star. So this is a potentially a way of creating um, hot Jupiter planets. Um, the Kozai mechanism is very much dependent on the initial stellar density in a star region, going back to, to what we were talking about at the start of, um, of the presentation. 
And um, the plot on the right hand side, I like to tell people that this is the only plot from my PhD thesis. So my PhD was uh, it's about 11, 12 years ago now. But the right hand plot is the only plot that's still relevant <laughs> of all the 120 pages or whatever in my PhD thesis. Um, and, and, and in some ways, I'm, I, I kind of heartens me that you know, the field does kind of move on, um, even if some of, some of us don't. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's a strong function of cell density. So the, the higher the cell density, the more likely you are to induce this cosine mechanism in binary systems. So up until now, I'm just going to finish the last five minutes. I'm gonna, um, up until now, I've told you that star forming environments are the most awful places for planets to form and evolve in and that they're very, very hostile environments. Um, so that's true, um, but it might not mean that all kind of, you know, all the sort of positive aspects are, are erased um, when we talk about planet formation and even the potential for, for forming life as we have on, on Earth. So the first thing I want to talk about is, um, is, is, is basically increasing the size of the habitable zone around a star or a stellar system. So, Habitable zones around single stars are fairly well defined. So all you have to worry about is the flux from um, the, the host star, okay? But if you have a binary system, then the stars can, in some cases, um, sort of double up in terms of their flux. So you, if, you, if you're a, a planet around a star in a binary system, you feel the, the heat or the flux from your, your parent star, but you also could potentially feel extra warmth from um, the companion star. So what we're showing here is um, the Hubble zones around two stars in a binary system. And we basically put that binary system in a star forming region. And that binary system suffers an interaction that pushes the two stars closer together. But in doing so, it increases the size of the habitable zone around the lower mass star. So if I just jump between the two slides, you can see that the thickness of the habitable zone around the lower mass star, initially it's quite small, but then after pushing the two stars closer together, it's feeling the, the flux from the, the, the more massive star, and that's increasing the size of the habitable zone. Now, this is a little bit of a, a cheat because you know, we, haven't, we haven't quantified what would happen to any planetary systems as a, you know, due to that interaction. All we're trying to demonstrate here is that you can increase the, um, the, the number of locations in a, in a stellar system where water could exist in, in liquid form. And the other thing that I want to mention um, at the end um, is that um, whilst we think that massive stars are very detrimental to planet formation because of their intense radiation fields, um, there is some evidence that the solar system was either formed from material enriched by a massive star or it was close to a massive star when it exploded as a supernova um, early on in its life. The reason for that is that in um, some of the oldest objects in the solar system, there are short-lived radioactive isotopes, aluminum-26 and iron-60, um, that are only really formed in the um, cores of massive stars. Um, you can produce aluminum-26 other ways, but iron-60 is exclusively formed in the insides of massive stars. And so, if we observe the um, decay products of aluminum 26 and iron 60 in the meteorites in the solar system, that suggests that the sun was close to a massive star, um, either close to its wind or close to um, the star when it exposes a supernova. And so one of the hypotheses, there's different hypotheses for incorporating these short-lived radioactive isotopes into the solar system. But one of the hypotheses is that um, the sun's protoplanetary disk just happened to be close to a massive star that exposed a supernova and was enriched in this material. Now, even just focusing on that one mechanism for doing this gives you an, a really, really vast distribution of, um, of these short-lived radioactive isotopes. So in some stellar systems, uh, some planetary systems, you get a lot of, um, of these short-lived radioactive isotopes and then consequently you get um, internal heating of the planets from these short-lived radioactive isotopes. Um, and in some systems, you don't get any at all. So this is some work that was done by um, Tim Lichtenberg, um, who he, he basically quantified how much radiogenic heating, so how much, how much heat can you put into a planetary system from these short-lived radioactive isotopes, um, in, in, and, and, and how, does, how does that affect the planetary system as it evolves? So in the star regions, you get a huge distribution of these isotopes. 
Um, but if you then focus on um, the, the effect that these isotopes have on planetary systems, basically, if you have large amounts of aluminium 26, then your planets have less water in them and they are drier as they're forming. And so um, dry plants get drier and then plants that have no aluminium 26 remain, have a, a very, very large water content. And the, the kind of big picture of all of this is that short-lived radioactive isotopes are thought to be crucial for um, getting plate tectonics on planets started. And so um, Tim um, did this, this, uh, this is some work that I wasn't involved with, but um, Tim had a really nice paper uh, on this a couple of years ago where he showed that um, if you have solar system levels of aluminum 26, then you're likely to produce from um, geophysical calculations, you're likely to produce um, what we call shoreline planets. So these are planets like Earth, planets that have liquid water oceans, have continental landmass, um, all of that kind of thing. But if you don't have any heating from aluminum 26, then you form um, what's kind of quite confusingly called ocean planets, but they're more like ice planets or ice worlds where they don't have these kind of continental land masses that planets like Earth have. And so Tim and his team went even further than that and said, okay, if we use the, um, the, the Plato mission to measure the radii of planets, we will be able to find out, uh, assuming things about the stellar density and the composition of planets, we will be able to distinguish planets that have had short-lived radioactive isotopes versus those that don't. And so one of the predictions of um, the short-lived radioactive isotopes is that you, know, you, you need these isotopes to have plate tectonics on Earth. And, you know, most of the time, plate tectonics are a very, um, very negative thing because you know they, they they create earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunami, but they are responsible to some extent for regulating the um, the, the the atmosphere of the planet. So it could well be that we need Earth and the Sun to form in a very dense star form region in order to get this enrichment in short lived radioactive isotopes from massive stars. So. I'm keen to take some questions. Unfortunately, I have to, um, I have to um, pass over my laptop to my son for some um, homeschooling um, in about 10 minutes or so. Um, so I'm keen to get any questions you might have. So I apologize for rushing through the last bit a little bit. But basically, I just want to summarize by saying that star form regions are generally hostile to planet formation, especially if you have massive stars. And dynamic interactions could potentially affect up to 30, 50% of all planetary systems. But we think that the solar system probably had to form in one of these star form regions in order to get these short lived radioactive isotopes. So the next phase of work that um, I'd like to do is to basically try and see if we can reach a balance between not destroying the planetary system, but also getting the right amount of radio, radioactive isotopes into the system that's, that's going to create a, you know, the conditions for planets as we see them in our own solar system. So I'll stop there. Um, thanks very much for listening and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Thank Richard. You. Very nice uh, talk. So now the talk is open for question. We have uh, 10 minutes, as Richard say. For doing that, please in the bottom menu, press the button reactions and then you can raise your hand there and uh, I will leave you uh, the question. Emilio, do you say okay or do you want to ask something? Yes, yes, I would like to do some question. Uh, congratulations, uh, Richard has been a very inspiring uh, talk. Well, my question is about the, 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 you know, the initial part of the talk uh, when you were talking about the, the cluster mass density. My question is how much influence the total mass of the cluster in this problem? That's a really good question, Emilio. Um, yes, so the, on average, um, the more massive the cluster, the, um, the more likely you are to have massive stars, which can um, you know, affect lots of things, including some of the stuff I talked about. Um, but also, if the more massive the cluster, it's probably going to survive for longer in the galactic field because um, you know, there, there are various ideas for how you disrupt clusters. So one of them is actually that the massive stars put so much feedback to the cluster that it blows it apart through gas expulsion. Um, but another idea is that um, clusters are destroyed just from the galactic field, the, 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 tidal, the tidal field of the rest of the galaxy just kind of 
gently peeling away stars from the cluster and reducing the mass and, and dissolving the cluster that way. So I think there's a lot of work still need, needs to be done to kind of quantify whether or not a 10,000 solar mass cluster survives for longer than a thousand solar mass cluster versus a hundred solar mass cluster. Um, I think we've got some hints of the answer there, but yeah, it's a really good question. It's something that we haven't really looked into in, in a lot of detail. So, um, if there is not other people asking, I can, <laughs> I have another question. <laughs> go on, Emilio, go on. Okay, the, 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 my question is about uh, what is the uncertainty in the, you know, in detecting uh, walk, uh, what you call walk uh, runaway star or walk away star? Because um, you know that the, the, the difference in velocity is uh, between five and 30 kilometers per second. So it may be some kind of a uh, field star or, you know, uh, I, don't, I didn't understand very well how do you detect this kind of uh, objects. Yeah, so it's, it's um, you've, got to, you've got to make sure that the stars traject, the trajectory of the star is pointing back towards the star from region that you think it came from. Um, but it's also got to be the same age as the star from the region. So to be sure that it probably originated there. Okay. Um, and we do, we do try and follow up um, the kind of proper motion velocity with a radial velocity measurement as well. Um, but yes, the, the, you know, the, the objects all have big, fairly big error bars. Um, and you, you, you know, I, I think it's fair to so say you're never 100% sure that what you're looking at is... Is, is definitely come from that star region, but you can have a kind of a, you can kind of have a sense of it. So, um, so yeah, um, I, I guess if, if, you, if you want to know more, um, check out um, Christina Schottler's paper, Schottler et al. 2020, All right. um, where she describes the uncertainties and, and how we dealt with them. Okay, thank you, I'll do. Thank you, Emilio. Do we have other questions for Richard? So I have one. <clears throat> I was very interested in the part that you mentioned the aluminum 26 to form terrestrial planets. Otherwise, the tendency is to form ocean water planets. Um, so this is really necessary to form the, the terrestrial planets or in, a, in, in, in any kind of disks uh, in the interior part, uh, if we have uh, silicates uh, there, we can form terrestrials without the uh, help of aluminum 26. Because this aluminum 26 is only favorable for a differentiation of the planet. Yeah, so it, it's important. I, I, should, I should have been a bit more careful with how I said this. So it, it doesn't stop you from forming terrestrial plants if you don't have aluminum 26. Right. Those planets will still be how you imagine terrestrial planets are, right? They will still be, like you said, predominantly composed of silicates. However, they will have a thick, we think they will have a higher water content, which usually would kind of manifest itself as being um, the, the, the top layer of the planet's mantle and crust will have a high kind of water or ice content. Right. But it's still a, it's still a terrestrial planet. Um, and it's, it's only something like Plato where you will be able to say, okay, that planet has a very, very slight different radius because it underwent heating from aluminum 26. So it's, it's, I, I, it, I, I should have been clear. You can still form terrestrial planets without aluminum 26. Right. Okay. Now it's clear. More question for Richard? We have three more minutes. He need to go. So and I, I understand from this answer that the you assume that the water on Earth is intrinsic from the disk. It's not exogenic. Um, this is a very nice point that I am asking myself also. No, I think well, I think I think the water still probably has to be. I think so. I think there's this the you know, the grand tack model for, for for the 
for the right. evolution of Jupiter and Saturn in yeah. and then out again. Yes. I think that's where you deliver, I think, well, as I understand it, that's the current idea for how you deliver most of the water to Earth. Um, but I, I think the, I think, I think that's separate from the, the aluminum 26 scenario. I, I think the, the aluminum 26 is more responsible for the kind of plate tectonics aspect of things rather than the, the water delivery. Right, correct, yes. Yeah, I was thinking that the Earth has this uh, thin layer of water and that water could come from, uh, from outside not from the formation of the plant, I mean. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I think the, the debate goes backwards and forwards about whether this has come from kind of comets that may have been... Right. Yeah, you know, comets or, or asteroids. Or, be... or whether it's you know, from the kind of the, the far reaches of the, the planetesimal belt and the right. solar system. Fine. Okay. Okay. Questions? More questions? Emilio, you open your microphone. Well, not only to, you know, only to thank uh, Richard for accepting our invitation and for really this very interesting talk. Uh, I see that you are moving to the planet uh, world. And so <laughs> from the star cluster, you know, I'm putting together both, uh, both topics is really very interesting. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, you'll be pleased to know, Emilio, I haven't, I haven't given up on cluster structure yet because I, I have a new PhD student who just started with me and he's working on that so I'm kind Look, of and, and I think you have a very good team right now no? a, a bigger team very fortunate yeah but very lucky with some really good students yeah so ah, good excellent and unfortunately unfortunately um, you know, the opportunities for working with the rest of Europe seem to be kind of decreasing because of our government but um, <laughs> um, you know, you should know that as scientists and, and astronomers, we, we still very much value um, you know, the friendship and collaboration that we have with the rest of Europe. Um, so I certainly consider myself still, still very much European. And I'm really looking forward to hopefully when this pandemic is over, really looking forward to meeting up with all of you again. Okay, in a way, I hope that um, all this problem can be solved in the next issue and everything is uh, going to the normality, as we say. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for this talk and for accepting this invitation. And uh, I hope we can meet, uh, you know, personally, no, no, not, very, not very long. All right. okay. Just a few words from Isabel that she needs to go. She apologized. And uh, again, thank you for this talk. And uh, it will be up, uploaded to YouTube. I will send you the link, just okay. if you want to distribute and let you go because your son is waiting to you. Uh, right. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.